Please turn with me in God's Word this morning to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. We are uh, continuing a series which I've entitled In Search of a King. In Search of a King. Uh, this series is going to take us about two years to work through. Nobody said amen. Anyways, um, it's going to take us a, a while to get through, but I promise you uh, there are some riveting uh, things in First and Second Samuel that we will discover as we walk through these books of God's Word verse by verse together. And uh, this morning uh, is a passage of Scripture which has tremendous importance and relevance, and yet most people are not aware of what it teaches. It's, it's not a story that we commonly uh, tell in Sunday school because its, it's meaning may be a little hard to perceive at first, and yet it is very clear, and we will find that one of the great hymns of the Christian faith is based off of this passage of Scripture and its tremendous meaning. It is one of the great hymns that we have sung this morning to give you a clue, and we will see more of that today. So 1 Samuel chapter 7, we're going to go back to verse 1, and we remember that the ark of God had been brought from place to place around Israel and then Philistia. We know that God had brought great plagues among the Philistines who had captured the ark. And so now the ark has been brought back to its home in Israel because the Philistines realize they don't want it. And it is brought back to Kiriath-Jerim. 1 Samuel 7 verse 1 and the men of Kiriath-Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Amenadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. And from the day that the ark was lodged at Kiriath-Jerim for a long time, a long time past, some twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Now think carefully. We, we read these verses last week, and I didn't talk too much about verses 1 and 2 as we finished the sermon last week, but think carefully of what you read here. As the ark is finally returned to its home, remember that the reason it left was because the sons of, of the high priest Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, thought that the nation would win in battle if they brought the ark of God with them. What they didn't realize is that the ark of the covenant of God was not a good luck charm, but rather God desires repentance and genuine faith from His people. And that God would bless His people and allow them to win in battle against their enemies, the Philistines, if their hearts would be faithful to Him. So there is no uh, special switch that we can flip. There is, there is no trick to getting God on our side or to pour out blessings upon us. Rather, God desires a sincere and contrite heart that is obedient and submitted to Him. And there is no other way to have the salvation and the subsequent blessings of God that come with being a child of God. Once again, we're not talking about merely material or physical blessings. I don't want you to misunderstand. As if the kingdom of God were that shallow. As if all that God could give were riches on the earth. I praise God that the gospel of Jesus Christ is far more precious than gold and silver. I praise God He hasn't left me with treasure that moth and rust will destroy, that thieves can break in and steal, but He has given us treasure in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. And those are the blessings that can only be had by a sincere and genuine faith with a heart that is submitted to God and to His Word. And we notice that the people, after the ark was brought back, they lamented over their sin and their disobedience toward God for how long? In verse 2, 20 years. 20 years they mourned over their sin and how they had so offended God. Now notice what has happened is a change. 
Previously, the people lamented that God had brought great destruction on them. Now they are lamenting the fact that they have offended Almighty God. They lamented over their sin a long time, not after their hardships, but after the Lord. Sometimes people just want God to be on their side so that they will not have to suffer. They want God to get rid of their hardships in this life. as They want God to give them eternal life in heaven. But they don't really want God. They don't want to follow Jesus Christ. They just want a better life, an easy life, an eternal life in heaven. But the problem is, is you cannot have the blessings of the kingdom of God without submitting to Jesus Christ. And as I said earlier, the blessings of the kingdom of God are far greater than an easy life on this earth, but rather eternal life and joy both now and in eternity to come. And so, the people stopped lamenting the fact that they had been suffering. They, they stopped being upset that God had allowed them uh, and, and actually punished them and caused these great consequences for their sin, and now they finally realize, I've offended the Creator of heaven and earth. I've offended the Lord God Almighty. And I pray today that you understand the difference between suffering the consequences of your sin and wanting those painful consequences to go away and instead being broken over your sin and how you have personally offended the living God. There is a tremendous difference, brothers and sisters, between wanting the consequences of your sin to be relieved rather than wanting to be made right with the God whom you have offended with your sin. And Samuel makes sure that the people of Israel are at that place. He gives them 20 years to lament over their sin. When we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone we must help them understand that they are sinners in need of a Savior. I often hear this gospel presentation today. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a terribly insufficient attempt at sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know people who share that message mean well, but they are only sharing a sliver of the gospel and they have no explanation for why a person needs Jesus Christ when they say only that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Is that true? Yes, that is true. But think of what the lost sinner might think to themselves in response. Really? God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life? Well, me too. I love me, and I have a wonderful plan for my life. And maybe God will even make that plan better. Maybe I can add Jesus to my life, and I can have the cake of my sin and salvation. I can have my cake and eat it too. Wouldn't that be wonderful if I could just add Jesus to my life, not have to give up anything, and have eternal life through Him? I think I'll accept that kind of of a message. But that's not the message of the Gospel, is it? The message of the Gospel is God created us perfect. He created Adam and Eve sinless and perfect. And they turned against their Creator. And we, like Adam and Eve, have rebelled against the King of heaven and earth and we deserve to be punished as rebels should. And we are worthy of eternal hell. We deserve to pay the price for our sin. But God, who is rich in mercy and grace, sent His own Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, God in human flesh, to live a perfect life in our place that we could never live. And He died a perfect death. A sinless Lamb was sacrificed to pay for our sin. And our sin was placed upon Jesus at the cross of Calvary. And when we trust in Him by faith, His perfect righteous life which He lived for us is given to us so that when God sees 
The one who has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and trusted in His sacrifice, God does not see the sin because that sin is nailed to the cross where Jesus was. Rather, He sees the perfect righteousness of His own Son, Jesus Christ. You see, that is the Gospel. It is much more than God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. If you want to say that, that's fine. But you need to include those other details as well. Because otherwise, if you tell a person if they believe in Jesus, they can be saved, you must realize they don't know they need to be saved. Saved from what? From God and His punishment and His wrath towards sinners and their sin. And only through Jesus Christ is their salvation from God's righteous punishment against sinners. And so, Samuel gives 20 years for the people to dwell on the seriousness of their sin and how unworthy they are of God's mercy and grace and how they deserve everything that they have received. We, when we share the Gospel, often don't want to give 20 seconds for the sinner to realize the seriousness of their sin. Samuel gave the nation of Israel 20 years before sharing the good news. Now, I'm not saying you need to wait forever to get to the good news, but there is a principle here that Samuel understands. They must realize the seriousness of their sin and their need of God's grace and salvation before they can ever truly have God's grace and salvation. And so after they've lamented over their sin, and it is clear that this is a genuine contrition and brokenness of heart, then and only then, in 1 Samuel 7, verse 3, does Samuel share the good news of the Gospel. In verse 3, we read, And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, that word returning means to repent. It means to turn away from your sin and to run to God. It is the word to repent. So if you are returning to the Lord, or if you are repenting and coming to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve Him only. And He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Samuel says in verse 3, if you're going to repent of your sins, if you're going to come to the Lord, you must turn away from this world and its lies and its false religion and values permanently. You must turn your back on your sin and your old way of life and run to God for salvation and mercy and grace. And if you are not serious then don't even pretend. Don't even mock God with an insincere faith, which really shows that you don't take God and His holiness seriously. But if you are truly repentant, Samuel says, then turn away, put away your foreign gods that you've been worshiping. What are the foreign gods in your life? What are the things that you've been putting before the Lord Jesus Christ? What are the things that are idols in your heart? What are the things that you need to put behind you so that you can run to the cross of Jesus Christ? Samuel says, only if you're willing to do that should you then make a profession of faith. Don't mock God. He will not be mocked. He knows your heart. You cannot fool Him. You may be able to fool others and even yourself, but you will not fool God if you're sincere then and only then should you come to Him in faith. Verse 4, So the people put away the bells and the Ashtaroth, and they serve the Lord only. Praise God, amen. It's a revival. And it's a real one. This is not smoke and mirrors. They are not merely walking the aisle and then going out the church doors to return to live their life the way they always had. They are broken over their sin, and yes, they are walking the aisle so to speak but it is to show that there's a genuine faith and they are changed from that day forward forever. 
Oh, you must see that there's a real faith here. And we know it's real because they began to follow the Lord and they continued to follow the Lord. This morning in Sunday school, we read the parable of the soils. And we see that the soil that fell on the rocky ground, it it sprang up quickly. But then the sun came out and scorched it. We see the the seed that fell among the the thorns, that the thorns, which are the cares of this life and the pride of life and other things, choked out the seed so that it could no longer grow and it withered and it died. We see that there are those who make a profession of faith and do not continue in that faith and thereby prove that they never were planted in the good soil. Because if they had been, the Scriptures say, they would have produced a harvest 30-fold, 60-fold, or even 100-fold. 1 John 2, verse 19 says about those who walked away from the early church, the Apostle John says in 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us because they are not of us. They went out for this reason, so that it might become plain to all it might become plain to all that they were never of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. That is what the scriptures teach. That a person who is truly born again will continue in faith, not by their power, but by the grace which God so graciously provides so richly pours out on his people that he changes their heart and they will choose to follow Jesus Christ not perfectly but they will continue to follow Jesus Christ from that day forward and these people did verse 5 we read about a great worship service After this revival has taken place, the nation is gathered at Mizpah to have a a great worship service because part of being a child of God is that you want to gather with God's people and worship Him. It's just natural to the child of God. So in verse 5, Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people at Mizpah. The judging here is the leadership of the nation. They didn't have a king at this time. They had a judge. And he was the God-ordained leader of the nation, both spiritually and politically. Verse 7, Now when the Philistines heard that the people had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Imagine this, here they are to have basically a national worship service with their wives and their children. And their neighbors, their enemies, the Philistines, see this great crowd of what was, I don't know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. I'm not sure a lot. This great crowd has gathered to worship together and the Philistines go, hey, we'll kill them all in church. This will be easy. They're sitting ducks. This is a golden opportunity to attack and we will get our revenge on the Israelites and defeat them once for all. And it does seem that God led His people to Mizpah to be sitting ducks. But if you would make that conclusion, you would be forgetting the God who protects them and His power, which is far greater than that of the foolish Philistines. Verse 8, The people are afraid, and the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that He may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Now that is a profound spiritual understanding that the people, not just Samuel, their prophet, but the people understood that if they were going to be rescued from the hand of this great army, that only God could do it. So Samuel continued to pray and cry out to the Lord so that He will save us 
from the hand of the Philistines. Now, what did we see in the previous chapter, verse, uh, chapter 6 of 1 Samuel? The hand of the Lord had been against the Philistines. And now the hand of the Philistines is against God's people. And so now the question is, what's stronger? The hand of the Lord or the hand of the Philistines? The hand of the Lord. And that is about to be demonstrated to us in beautiful fashion. Verse 9. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Why did Samuel take a baby lamb and offer it at a sacrifice? After all, the army is coming to attack. Why take the time to have a sacrifice of this lamb? Well, first and foremost, because that's what the Word of God requires that when the people would come to worship Him, that there would be a sacrifice for their sins, that they would confess their sin as they had done earlier when they said in verse 6, we have sinned against the Lord, and now we read in verse 9 that the people have a sacrifice to atone to cover their sin in this lamb that is offered on the altar. And I don't know if Samuel knew it on that day, I don't know how much he was aware of the significance of that sacrifice, but the entire reason that God instituted the sacrifice of lambs and bulls on an altar was because that one day the Lamb of God would come to take away the sins of the world. And that maybe Samuel didn't know it on that day, but the entire sacrificial system would ha which had been been instituted a few hundred years earlier through the law of Moses points to the cross of Jesus Christ. Because this baby lamb did not cover the people's sins. But Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, when He came, He covered their sins. He paid the price for our sin. He suffered the punishment that we deserve in eternal hell. Jesus suffered it on the cross of Calvary. And so... The lamb being offered shows the need that God's people's sins would be covered by a lamb from God. It points to Jesus Christ. And the Lord answered when Samuel cried. Verse 10, And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered, with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion and they were defeated before Israel. Now in verse 10, we don't know exactly what this looked like, but the language here suggests that the Lord thundering against the people may have been very literally thunder, a storm. Maybe it wasn't, but in some way, God through a mighty sound confused the army of the Philistines. And it's likely that it was a thunderstorm. Have you ever been in an utter downpour? Have you ever been driving down the road and it rains so hard that you just have to pull over because you can't see five feet in front of your windshield? You can't even see the front of the hood of your car because when it's raining that hard, when the thunder is that great, there is such a tremendous confusion that you are crippled by the power of that kind of storm. Maybe that's what God used here. Ultimately, we don't know. The details of how God confused the Philistines really are irrelevant. But He used something, some sort of supernatural intervention to confuse and confound the army of the Philistines. And in that confusion, God's people were not confused and they defeated the Philistines. Verse 11, And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and they pursued the Philistines as the Philistines were running away from this much smaller force. And they struck them as far as Beth Carr. We had people who looked so vulnerable as they worshipped the Lord on that day and an army showed up at church to murder them all became victorious because the Lord God was on their side. And He was on their side not because they had the ark amongst them, 
but because they were trusting in the Lord for salvation. You cannot use some sort of trickery or some sort of tradition or ritual to get God on your side. Coming to church won't do it. Being baptized won't do it. Taking the Lord's Supper won't do it. And those things are very important and good. But the only thing, the only way that we can receive the grace and mercy and salvation of God is through a sincere faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our only hope. And without that, it's just a bunch of smoke and mirrors. These people had truly trusted in the Lord and the Lord was there for them. Now in verse 12, listen to Samuel as he builds a monument to God's salvation of his people on that day. Verse 12, Then Samuel took a stone and he set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer. The Hebrew word Ebenezer in English Ebenezer means literally stone of help or stone of strength. He erects this stone. He, he places this large stone between Mishpah and Shen where the people defeated the armies of the Philistines. And he called the name of that great stone Ebenezer, stone of strength. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. In other words, the stone represents God who is our strength, who is our helper. And what Samuel is saying is, let no one think that we delivered ourselves from the army of the Philistines. No, God delivered us on this day. He is our strength. He is our helper. And He alone is able to rescue us. In other words, he is saying, I don't want to take any credit. I don't want to think myself great. But I want to proclaim on this day that God and God alone has saved His people. My goodness, how true that is. And it reminds me of a man in Scripture who did the, in the, the very opposite. A man whom God had blessed richly with success. And rather than crediting God for these blessings, he gave himself praise and glory. That man is King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. And I want you to hear what happened to that prideful man. Daniel 4 verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal pa palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, as he looks around at his, from his mighty palace on his kingdom, the most powerful man in the world, literally, at that time, he said, Is this not great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty. In other words, all praise and glory and honor be due to me, not to God, but me. This great nation is a testimony to my mighty power and my glory, said King Nebuchadnezzar. And then it says in Daniel 4, verse 31, And while the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over to you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever He wills. You're not in control, Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord says, I am. And you only experience this success at my hand. And I'm going to take it away from you just to prove who's on the throne. And it's not you. Immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men. And he ate grass like an ox. 
and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. God humiliated this man for years because of his pride. Now God eventually forgives him and Nebuchadnezzar repents. But brothers and sisters, do not credit yourself but God alone for every blessing in your life. That is what Samuel understands here. Do not credit yourself for the fact that you were able to care for your family, that you have food to eat today. Have you earned it with the work of your hands? Yes, but it was provided to you by God Almighty, and you would have not had the opportunity to earn that paycheck, to feed your family, to have a roof over your head, if God Almighty had not provided it, and He could take it in a moment, just like He took the kingdom from Nebuchadnezzar. So not to us, O Lord, not to our name, give glory, Psalm 115, verse 1, but to Your name alone give glory, and then verse 3 of Psalm 115 says, For our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. I pray that you would understand that today. When Samuel erects this stone, Ebenezer or Ebenezer, he is saying, God is the one who has brought us here, and it is to His credit and His glory alone. As a church, we have experienced the tremendous blessing of God in the last year or two. I have watched this church nearly double in number over the last few years. God has so richly blessed us. I look out at a church today and I don't even know if half of you were a part of this church when I first came as your pastor three and a half years ago. And brothers and sisters, understand this. It is not because of you or me or any one of us that God is so richly blessed. First Baptist Pollock. It is for His own glory and the praise of His own name. And if we for a moment think that we have done it, or certainly if we would possibly think that I as a pastor have done this, then God could take that from us in a moment, in the blink of an eye. God may have used us to accomplish His purposes, but they were all for His glory and His praise and His honor. And we are nothing but instruments in God's almighty hand. Let us remember that we have nothing that He has not so richly provided. And He gets all the credit and all the glory and all the praise and He alone. It's true in your life. It's true in our church. And I pray that today in your heart, you would set a stone of Ebenezer to say, God is my strength, God is my help, and He alone is to be praised for all that I have and all the blessings He's given. Verse 13, So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Yeah, the hand of the Philistines were against Israel, but the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. And we see who won. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel delivered from the territory of the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between the Philistines and the Amorites. God blessed His people, gave them their lands back, and gave them peace. And then in verse 15, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gagal, and Mizpah, leading the worship of the nation. And he judged Israel in all these places. And then he would return to Ramah, and his home was there. And there he also judged Israel. And he built there an altar to the Lord. There was a great season of revival and growth spiritually, in the nation of Israel. And all the glory was given to God. Church, may we do the same. We are indeed experiencing a season of revival and growth. And all the praise and glory are due to God. He does it for the glory of His name, not ours. He uses us to proclaim Jesus to this community and to the nations. 
And praise God we get to be a part of it. Amen? Praise God that we just get to have the blessing of being a vessel of His grace and sharing this life-saving, soul-saving, life-changing truth with those around us. Ebenezer. I know that name's not popular for children anymore ever since Charles Dickens ruined it with the character Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. That was a good story, but no one wanted to name their child Ebenezer after that because he was a villain. But what a beautiful truth that name represents. God is our strength. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for each one here. And God, how I pray. And in our hearts, we would each set up a stone of Ebenezer to say that you are our helper. You are our strength. You are our only Savior. And that everything we have and every blessing that we so richly can partake of is provided by You and You alone. Lord, in this church and in our hearts, may Jesus Christ receive all glory, honor, and praise. As Psalm 115.1 says, Not to us, not to us, O Lord, give glory, but to Your name. God, help us. Help us to be committed in our hearts to give glory to You and You alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.